Good evening, everyone. I will call the city council portion of our joint city council school board meeting to order. Good evening. I'll, I'll also do the same for the Bloomington school board. Thank you all for being here tonight. I appreciate it. We realized it was more than three years ago. It was pre-pandemic the last time these two boards got together. And much has happened in the community since then, and there's been a lot going on. And so I really appreciate the work that went into pulling this meeting together. I appreciate the willingness of the bodies to come together and, and have this discussion and, and learn. And I appreciate uh, uh, in advance everybody's willingness to do this again in the future. This, I think, is something I know that the city council has spoken about and has uh, spoken that we want to make a uh, common occurrence, a regular occurrence. Hope that we could see that also from our, our school board. I will. Uh, it, it was interesting that our, uh, strateg uh, our racial equity strategic planning process, one of the recommendations they made was that these two bodies should meet on a regular basis. And I think that's a, it, it's a very sound idea for, for many, many reasons. So very happy that we are here this evening and very happy that we've got such a, a robust agenda and, and a lot of good information that will be coming forward for us. Uh, I will point out to our, our guests and to our council members the microphones in front of you are, are quiet unless the green light is on. So you have to push the green light for the microphone to be hot and uh, otherwise, and then push it when you're, when you're not, push it too off when you're not speaking and, and uh, cuts down on the ambient noise in the room and the, uh, the hot mic uh, syndrome that sometimes goes on when you have a hot mic in front of you as well. So, uh, Mr. Chair, welcome. Thanks for being here this evening. Anything to add as we get started? Yeah, well, thank you for the invite. We love being back in the uh, council chambers, and I, like you said, it's been over three years since the last time we had one of these, and there's a lot of new school board members and, and uh, council members, so it's great to, to be back here, and hopefully we can get in the pattern of doing these every couple months and going back and forth of you guys hosting and then us hosting, and I think I we had some productive conversations back when we were doing this, so mm -hmm. I'm glad we're, we're back at it and look uh, forward to the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, council, uh, board members, we have the agenda in front of us. Actually, we've got seven items on the agenda uh, beyond the call to order and the adjournment. Uh, we have five items, and they're all pretty beefy items. And so I would ask that uh, uh, as these informational items come before us, we make sure our questions are directed and our comments are, are succinct so we can make sure that we get every, through everything in a timely fashion. If we could do that, that would be fabulous. So with that, I will call item two on our agenda, uh, discussion tonight on enrollment trends. John Weiser, am I pronouncing that correctly, John? Correct. John Weiser, good evening, welcome. Good evening. Thank you. You, want, you don't want me to do this? <laughs> I was gonna say, we'll see how, how well I do it uh, using technology I've never used before in another environment. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor, uh, Board Chair, council members, board members, uh, and speaking public. Uh, I'm here tonight to give you a, an update on uh, our enrollment trends over the past several years and looking a little bit into the future. I'm John Weiser, Director of Technology for, for the uh, Bloomington School District. Included in your packet is the 20, 2021 enrollment report. This is a report that our data team puts together every fall um, that gives a snapshot of across the district what, what do our schools look like from a demographic and enrollment perspective. When I get a call from a community member, uh, this is often the place that I send them when they're asking about what our schools are like, if they're not familiar with Bloomington, if they're not familiar, if they're just having school-aged children and they wanna know more about the school down the street. Um, uh, I'm a former teacher, so I like to give uh, uh, some homework, and so my homework would be, I'm gonna touch on a few of the slides in this report, but I think it's always a good idea for leaders in our community and leaders of our district to be really familiar with the types of families that come to our school system, that live in our community, and I think this gives a good snapshot from a data perspective on that, uh, on that information. So I'm gonna ask you to go to slide five. As I said, there's a lot of numbers in this report. I'm, a, I'm just gonna touch on a couple things that, that pertain to enrollment. I'll give you a little guide, a little walk through as, uh, on a couple of those couple of those pages. So on page five of that report, you'll see an enrollment, uh, a nice chart that gives you kind of a breakdown by grade level and by school. Along the left-hand column, you see our two high schools, Jefferson High School, Kennedy High School, um, their ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade enrollments there. 
Again, this is last year, 2021, so the, the class had just graduated this spring. Our three middle schools are there, Oak Grove Middle School, Olson Middle School, Valley View Middle School, uh, giving you a little guide to the, the initials. Uh, and then 10 elementaries in our community, starting with Hillcrest, and the last one there uh, is Westwood, WW. You'll see NCA sprinkled throughout each three levels. NCA is New Code Academy. That is our online school for families who are entirely online with us in the district. This is a program in a school that was developed um, really in response to the pandemic, but also um, as part of uh, representing the needs of our families, the growing needs to be more remote. We're continuing this program as we come out of the pandemic because uh, we're finding it's not a lot of our, our community, but it is some important um, number, uh, important part of our community that still needs these kind of services. So where you see NCA, you'll, that's new code. Along the bottom, you can see in the lower right, our enrollment uh, coming, out of, coming into this school year was 9,805 students. We typically, uh, I'm going to steal a line from our superintendent, uh, Dr. Melby sometimes says, we're a school district built for 10,000 students, and meaning the facilities, the staffing, the infrastructure is built for about 10,000 students. We've had about 10,000 students for pretty much as long as I've been in this role. We're down a little bit, 9,805 students, um, but we're rebounding, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. Right next to that number, you'll notice our graduating class from this spring of 812 students. Uh, by comparison, I went in and looked a little earlier today. Um, our current graduating class is, is a little higher than that. 840 students in Bloomington will graduate this year. On the other end of that bottom row is our incoming kindergarten class. This is an important number we pay attention to because it represents the students who start their journey with us tend to stay with us. Um, we like to see an incoming kindergarten class around 700. You can see there it was at 708 last year. When I checked again earlier today, I saw um, that our kindergarten class is down a little bit. We're at about 680, so we're off about 20 students. And that's a, that, so that's something we'll be watching over time. To understand the nuances of our, of our school as it changes from different parts of the, of the city and the district, um, if, you looked at if you look at slide six, I'll talk you through a little bit of the demographics that we pay attention to, and that kind of gives you a guide for the next few pages. Again, my guidance to leaders in our district are get to know the schools, especially those that you live next to, or that are down the street, or when you're going to present to a, to a building. You should have a sense of who you're talking to, and it really is part of the goals of our board, is to engage our community, understand our community as we engage with them. Along that left-hand column, you'll see um, tor toward the top there that we are a 54% ethnically diverse district. Uh, we have about 14% of our students who receive English language services sometimes referred to as EL or multi-language. We have about 36% of our families, our, of our students, are families that qualify for free and reduced lunch. To us, this is an indicator of other learning barriers. Those families might also have challenges around transportation, um, providing food outside of the school day, uh, things like winter coats and so on. So these represent challenges for us so that we can get to learning, learning supports. You can see on that same column that 14% of our students receive special education services. And lastly, a healthy indicator of good news is that about 9% of our students actually open enroll into our district. They're, they're getting in a car, driving to Bloomington to get an education here every day. Those are the two pages I wanted to touch on. You can look at more detail around uh, any of the individual schools if you want. Again, if you if you're going to a school, my encouragement would be get to know what kind of community that that school is serving. There are some enrollment trends here in this report, but I'm going to switch after this report. In your packet of materials is a chart that looks kind of like this and a couple more that I want to talk about before I open it to questions. So let me fast forward here. Uh, I think I got these, these two slides mixed, so uh, bear with me. I'm looking at the slide here with the blue line. That blue line represents 
our enrollment looking a few years back, starting at the 15-16 school year uh, and going forward to the current year, plus a couple years into our future. That blue line up until 22-23 represents our actual enrollment. Everything forward of 22-23 is uh, projections forward. You can see that 2021 was a challenging year. Now, that represents the dip due to COVID. We went from a 10,009 student district in uh, 1920 down to 9,645 students. Uh, the black line is the projections, what we were projecting forward when we were in 2019. So pre-COVID, our projections developed by our finance department, Executive Director Rod Zivkovich here, he's gonna be presenting with me in a moment, um, does those projections, they're very accurate, uh, we usually hit those marks pretty well. Um, you can see that, that dip that we took that kind of took us off that projection track. You can also see the good news, which is coming out of the 2021 school year, we saw a rebound start. And so we saw a jump of about 150 students. And we see that rebound continuing into this school year. And so in the 2022-23 school year, this current school year, we see that our numbers are, are about the same there. The slide that you have that might be one, one back in your packet, because I, again, I apologize, I think I put these in the wrong order, shows two orange lines. That shows our forecasting, or uh, Director Zivkovich's forecasting, on an optimistic projection of where enrollment might go, as well as a conservative projection. The good news about this slide is like, as we plan for coming out of COVID and coming back into a, uh, uh, an, a more regular cycle of education, we're hugging that optimistic line. So it, that would indicate to us that we're, we're coming back and that rebound of, of families coming back to public education in Bloomington is, is gonna continue. The last slide I wanna share with you and then I'll open up to questions is, um, well, I'll start with a thank you. I, I thought was connecting with Dr. Nick Kelly uh, as we were getting ready here. We've worked with Bloomington Public Health, Bloomington, Pub Bloomington Schools has, uh, I've worked with Nick's team on many data projects uh, where we share information. Uh, it's always been a very great working relationship. One of the pieces of data that we, we monitor in the district is the births in Bloomington. Not all of these families that have kids uh, end up in our public school system, but the number of births in Bloomington is kind of a good forecast indicator of what our kindergarten class is gonna look like a few years down the road. Or our early childhood programming just a couple years uh, coming after those births. So what we look for here in a healthy community uh, from a school perspective is we've had about 1,000 births per year, and you can see that, that line over this 10-year over this period staying at about 1,000 births per year. That's generally a good sign. The last two numbers on that green line uh, have a little asterisk. That means it's provisional data. We get updated um, when Nick's team and, and my team connect uh, in the spring, and so those numbers, they do get corrected, and so they do move a little bit we would be hoping that those numbers would um, get closer to that 1,000 mark. You can see there also how that corresponds to our, our kindergarten class. Again, you'd have to kind of go back far, five years or forward five years to, to have those kids enter our kindergarten class, but you can see our kindergarten enrollment over that similar period of time when births are stable, typically our enrollment stays stable. So we like that in, in planning for education. We like a stable community, stable environment um, in terms of, um, of birth rate and in terms of um, uh, our planning. So with that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Weiser. Questions from the council? Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm just curious, looking at the, the um, timeline of free and reduced lunch eligibility, I guess I sort of would have expected during the pandemic with the economic challenges and so on that there would be an increase in free and reduced lunch eligibility. And in fact, we've seen the opposite. I'm just curious if you have any insight into why that might be the case. Yeah, I think I, I, think I do, but, I'm, but it's a little bit of uh, my personal insight and observation because uh, I don't have uh, the data to back this up. But 
what we saw was a federal lunch program became uh, free and open to families. Um, having that free and having that lunch program be paid for is an incentive to do the paperwork to apply for free and reduced lunch. And so uh, that combined with families actually not coming to school, right, remote learning, or maybe moving from remote learning back to school and back and forth meant uh, the number of applications and getting parents to fill out applications to qualify for free and reduced lunch uh, was down and it was more of a struggle. So most of that difference I would assign to those two, those two purposes. So the difference between projections and actuals in terms of enrollment that, that you see, um, three questions. Where, where did the students go? Do you know why? And what is the district doing and what can the city do to help to bring them back? Usually when I give this report, that's a question I don't answer. <laughs> the why, the <laughs> which, why which part? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll give a little bit of insight. The, we, we look at other data for the choices that our families are making. So we look at the number of families who choose uh, things like charter schools or homeschool or um, parochial, parochial school. And some of those numbers stay pretty stable. Some of them change over time. Uh, really, family choice around charter schools is the one that pretty, is very fairly consistently growing each year. So families are more and more exercising that choice um, to go to charter schools. The number of homeschool families, the percentage of uh, families that go to tuition paid schooling options has been pretty stable. COVID also threw a, a wrench in those kind of calculations and decisions. And so where one of those numbers was stable, it became kind of erratic. And where one of them was erratic, it became stable. And those patterns are starting to level out again now, too. Thank you. Any additional questions? Well, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up on our agenda, we'll make a switch to the housing market, which in Bloomington is about as interesting as uh, enrollments is a lot of, a lot of times. <laughs> uh, Mike Palermo from our planning department is here to lead us through um, our discussion on housing. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, board members. So, little correction, I am no longer with the planning okay, department. Okay, I forgot, I'm sorry. <laughs> you're, you're with the Port Authority now, I apologize for that, Mike. <laughs> Um, but to give you a little background, I was with the planning department for five years, I, about a month ago maybe now. I'm not entirely sure. It kind of blends together. I'm now with the Port Authority as an economic development analyst. But in my new role, I will continue to be working with housing. So it's a natural fit to give you the housing update. So I'll kind of go into three parts of my presentation. We'll talk about where we saw growth from 2010 to 2020 in the decennial census, where we've seen grown, where we expect growth since and then just a little bit development update. And I'll try to be quick. I can, as council knows, I have all sorts of numbers that I can slice and dice, but um, I'll give you a high level overview. So from 2010 to 2020, using our decennial census, uh, we saw about an 8.6% growth in our total population. You can see our households didn't grow at quite the same rate. So part of why we have that is because you can see there our household size grew, so people, children, in your, more children in your household. Uh, you can see our housing units didn't grow at that same rate either, so vacancy rate goes down. So all those can impact what our total population is. Uh, similar to the school district, we saw increase in BIPOC population. We see the school district numbers as kind of leading indicators of greater citywide. Uh, we really enjoy that report you put out. I look at that annually and see how that uh, compares with census data and other sources, so keep doing that. And I know our planning division will use that quite a bit. Uh, but you can see our white non-Hispanic population is relatively stable, a little bit of a decrease. Uh, so that's holding stable while we see most of our population growth in the BIPOC population. And then you can see here, under 18 is growing, but not as fast as over 18. And it's just kind of how they put out the decennial census, how they dis distinguish that, because it's for voting purposes. So where did we see that population growth from 2010 to 2020? It was in our development districts. So we have three development districts that we've 
uh, work to really focus concent and concentrate our development. So we have the South Loop Development District on the eastern portion by the mall. Uh, it's kind of a big census tract, but you can see we had 30% increase in population in that census tract. Our second uh, highest growth was in the Penn American District. You can see our census tracts are a little bit wonky, but it's primarily where the population growth is happening. And then our Normandale Lake uh, District to the, the west, kind of by Normandale Towers, that area, that's also seen population growth as well. And we anticipate continued growth in those districts. So since 2020, since the 2020 count, we've had 11 buildings that were completed with a little over 2,000, 2,072 units that have opened. So we're continuing to see population growth. And you can see here, we distinguish affordable versus fully market rate. Most of our uh, buildings now have an affordable component. And it's kind of important when you're thinking school district because those affordable units tend to have families in them with children. You tend to uh, more likely to income qualify the larger family you have. So we see a higher rate of families in those affordable units. So every year, uh, Met Council gives us population uh, updates or estimates, uh, kind of building off the census data that comes out decennially. We have not received our 22, 2022 estimate yet, so we know how they formulate it. So our planning division kind of came up with what we anticipate will be our 2022 uh, population. We can see here with those 2,000 units, um, using a factor of uh, 1.8 for multifamily plus uh, the vacancy rate thrown in there, and then we also have group quarters, which I'll explain in the next slide. Uh, you can see we're experiencing about 1% growth per year. So that's something we can kind of use to kind of extrapolate out into the future. And so if we use that 22 as our base looking forward, we have 41,000 units, vacancy rate of 4.3, which is about what we, we would like and expect. About 5% is usually what your, your goal is um, per household. And group quarters is people who are not in a unit. It's not counted in that 41 units. It's like a bed, so like a dormitory or skilled nursing facility. Um, they're counted a little bit different in the census. So you can see on this slide with the asterisks, uh, those are the ones that uh, were completed that were on that initial map. And then I'll go over the ones with the double asterisk. Those are the ones that are under construction right now. These are all our projects. And then there are some at the bottom there that have been what we call entitled. They've been approved, but they have not uh, started construction yet. And so this is a table that uh, our council is very familiar with. It highlights our metropolitan council housing goals. Uh, as we update our comprehensive plan every 10 years, we get from the Met Council kind of what our allocation uh, for affordable housing units should be. Uh, and you can see here they break them down by what we call income bands, so 60% area median income, AMI. And that's about, um, for a family of four, that's about $70,000 a year. And so we break it by 60%, 50%, and 30%. The 50% is about 58,000, and 30% is $35,000 for a family of four, so extremely low income. And you can see that's where our greatest needs are. It's the hardest to construct units that can serve those families and kind of fill that gap. But it's a priority for uh, the city to kind of work on enc encouraging those production. We have our opportunity housing ordinance and other tools that we use to kind of help get us closer to those goals. So these are those projects where they are, and you can see it concentrated again in South Loop, our Pen American, and a few other projects here and there. And so we can use that information to kind of come up with what a, a, our future, in Bloomington we like to tie it to units, that population growth, to give us a little more grounded forecasting. There's lots of different ways to do it. The births are great for, you know, looking at that enrollment factor, and that's one way that some communities do it. But we have this rich, robust uh, project pipeline that we can rely on. So we know the certain projects are ones that are under construction, so we're fairly certain that it'll be completed. 
Uh, the likely ones are ones that we know are, are most likely going forward, and we still have a lot, quite a few in the maybe that have, are the ones that have been entitled, but we're not, not sure if they'll uh, move forward for whatever reasons. It could be uh, costs or timing or uh, all sorts of different things that happen in development that might prevent that. And one thing to point out, we have Oxborough Heights on this list. If we did this presentation a year ago, Oxborough Heights wouldn't have been on there. <laughs> this is a new one that uh, has just popped up, and I believe going to council pretty soon here for their entitlement. Um, so it's not a perfect science. You know what we're saying today might change Project X, or uh, might end up on that likely list as it moves forward in the development cycle, and some of these might fall off. And you know, it's all going to be a wash in the end, hopefully. And so. So our best kind of estimates. And so we kind of came up with a low and medium estimates. We have a high estimate, but we're, you know, didn't want to kind of put that out there. I think the median estimate is kind of comfortable where we're comfortable in the planning division for the next five years. That five percent, a little over five percent, so that one percent growth per year kind of kind of fits with if we just took that trend line, but also it fits with what we see on the units that are in the pipeline. And we apply a few different assumptions to get our low estimate. That assumes that there's no change in our pop, uh, household size, that uh, maybe our vacancy rate goes up a little bit, so less units are, or more vacant units, um, and then just less units that were produced. Maybe some of those uh, in the maybe category don't get uh, under construction. Uh, whereas the medium kind of assumes that those likely and will actually get completed, that our vacancy rate stays about the same, that maybe our population uh, per household kind of grows a little bit. Um, Bloomington, it's, it was kind of a surprise to see that uptake in the last census, and hopefully that will continue to grow, and just variation with the group quarters. Uh, so we hope uh, to see in 2027 a population about 90 7,000. I want to highlight, um, just want to point out there, because this often gets lost, that, oh, these are multifamily projects that are getting constructed. Well, how is this going to impact schools? Well, our renter and owner population is almost equally occupied by families with children. So 24.7% of our renters have children, and 25.8% of our uh, owners have children. Now we have some single family homes that are renter, we have some multifamily that are owner occupied, but you know it's all about the same throughout. So when we're talking about unit production, you know, part of it is that affordability, part of it is that you know seniors move into a senior facility and free up a single family home. Um, there's all different factors that kind of weigh into that, but um, just because most of our projects are multifamily doesn't mean we're going to see, we're not going to see that growth in our youth population. And so I'll kind of quickly go through this. That's kind of the, the meat of the presentation, but these are developments that are coming online. We have a HRA development map, so people can go online and uh, kind of click on and see more detailed information. We also have our HRA annual report that gets into some more of the demographic data if you're interested in that. Um, so both of those are available on the Bloomington website. But the Air Apartments has recently opened. I th think it's fully open. There might be a few more uh, units under construction, but this was a unique project where the Crown Plaza Hotel converted units converted some hotel um, rooms into units. So 185 units there. And that's located, you can see the light rail right there in South Loop. We have the Cadence. This recently opened on Old Cedar Avenue, 68 units. And you can see this one was 100% affordable and different uh, income bands there. We have the Riser um, Senior Living Facility. This is also uh, in South Loop, kind of, you can actually see the uh, Crown Plaza in the background there, but this will be a beautiful property once it opens pretty soon. You can see it's getting close and look over the bluff. And then we have Carbon 31, which is BCS, our, our Bloomington Central Station fourth phase. Uh, so right on that kind of central uh, plaza area, we'll have a grocery store in there that's kind of 
part of it, and it doesn't look like much for now. That's the parking area that we're looking at, but once it's built out, it will look pretty similar to the first two phases, the Fenley and the Indigo, and kind of start to fill out that plaza a little bit more. And then Noble Apartments, this is a rendering, but you might remember on 8200 Humboldt, there was that uh, uh, white office building that was kind of dilapidated. <laughs> I'm trying to be kind about it, but it's gone. Um, actually, I was driving in one day, I saw a rainbow as I was driving by, seeing that vacant <laughs> side. I was like, um, but when the starting construction on that, and we'll have this nice uh, building that they kind of really kind of try to integrate in the neighborhood and be less impactful to the single family and really took design aspects to it. So. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Palermo. Uh, I, I do want to point out, if you could double back to the Metropolitan Council goals slide that you had there, because uh, if uh, the council has heard me talk about this in the past, and, and I'm sure others have as well, but when we talk about this, when we, the, when we talk about the notion of affordable housing, immediately images come to people's mind of, of affordable housing. But as, as Mike said, what we're talking about here is housing that people can afford. If we're, what did you say, was it 80% of AMI is $75,000? Is that correct? That's 60%. Is 60% that? of AMI. Yeah. So that, that's basically uh, our first year police officers, our, our, our teachers in, in the city, our people who work in our hospitality industry. So it, it is a, it's something that we focused on, and as you see there with the Metropolitan Council, they set goals for everybody in the metropolitan area, all cities in the metropolitan area. And right now, Bloomington, for our 2030 goals, we are at 77% of that goal right now. And I always make a point of saying, I guarantee that we have neighbors not too far from us that are about 77% behind us in that goal, in reaching that goal. There are folks that talk about this, they, they, they strive for it, they, they think about it, and they don't do what has been done here in Bloomington. Uh, and so this is something we're very proud of. I, this is the, the leadership by, by members of our, our city council, uh, members of the community who brought this forward originally, the work that we're able to do with our opportunity housing ordinance, and frankly, a willingness to tackle this and take this on in our development districts here in the city of Bloomington. And we have made significant strides. And it, it is something to be proud of as a, as a city and as, I mean, as a city as a whole, not just the folks who, who sit in this room, but as a whole, this is something to be proud of, I think. So just wanted to bring that forward, make sure we we're clear on that. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, I appreciate that statement in terms of, you know, when you talk about housing that, that people can afford, um, I think that's really a good point uh, that you bring forward. Um, the question that I had was around the households with children. And I was just curious um, as to whether or not how we compare with our peer cities or surrounding cities. And then, you know, if you were to look back historically, and you may not have that here. I just, you know, I, I remember when the last time we met was maybe about three years ago or so. I remember seeing something similar to that in, in terms of trying to do some comparisons. And if you don't, I don't want to put you on the spot if you don't have it today. But if you could talk generally about that, um, I, I would appreciate that. Yep. Councilmember Lohman. Uh Mr. Mayor, uh, board members, uh, we do tend to skew a little bit lower. We have about 20% of our population is youth, and I'm trying to, I don't have the specifics in front of me, but I know communities like Brooklyn Park tend to be more 25, 30%, you know, whereas Edina is an older community, they're, they're about what we are. And so um, you can definitely see in some of those growing communities they, they tend to attract more of those families, whereas the inner ring suburbs, for the most part, hover about that 20%. But we do skew older in our population compared to the metro. Additional questions? Uh, board Chair and then uh, Council Member Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I love the conversation of the housing affordability, and I think you, you hit it right on the head beginning when you said district enrollment goes hand in hand with um, our housing and affordability. And I'm grateful that the city council is uh, looking at, at um, home affordability to try to recruit more people to move to, to Bloomington, which helps our school district. So this is one of the big issues that the school district and the city council can work together on. And so um, the question that I have is, 
when in Bloomington, there's a good stock of what I guess we used to call starter homes, like a smaller home for like a, a young couple with maybe one or two kids. And then when they're ready, they're outgrow that and they're looking for a bigger home. There's not a lot of availability for for those families, and we're losing a lot of people. I don't know about a lot, but we're losing people to other more affordable communities, maybe south of the river. So I'm wondering, is there any emphasis from the from the city to try to provide housing for those families so that we can keep those families without losing them? Yeah. Uh, board President, uh, Board Chair, Chair, sorry, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the, there is some work on that. So part of uh, is part of that movement we see here, uh, we have one, two, three, four senior, five senior projects that have just opened and the riser is the sixth. And so what we saw in the last 10 years with, there was a lot of aging in place. That's part of why we skew older is that a lot of those uh, empty nesters just stayed in their home, those homes that otherwise the starter homes would have moved into, right? Um, and they didn't have a whole lot of options. Now we're playing a little bit of catch up with those six projects, uh, and we hope that that will create some more of that movement. They say, I, I'm forgetting on the exact number, but the, when the project opens, I think they said about 75% of the people that move into those senior projects are within the community. So you're gonna see that movement a little bit in the market. And so that, that that's one way. Um, other ways that we're looking at is just encouraging some infill development. We're working and council will shortly have an update on our single family home standards um, on ways to encourage some more of those infill lots to kind of create that movement and then create just that broader spectrum so that people uh, previously had single family homes or a certain type of multifamily home in Bloomington. Now we're getting a wide range of multifamily home uh, that you can live in and we can continue to work on that gradation and that um, stratification of different uh, single-family homes to encourage that movement. But I think that was part of the bottleneck was the senior population or aging in place that was kind of a newer phenomenon. You used to see this kind of 30-year cycle of turnover in neighborhoods, and we were reaching that, and then people didn't move out because there wasn't anywhere to move. You had the boomer population that was larger, and there wasn't just facilities there yet. So hopefully with this latest round of development, we'll see more of that movement in the next four or five years. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Mr. Palamaro. I don't know if you'll be the right one to answer this or not, but um, my question is, so when through your information, we saw 8% growth in the last uh, decade based on the census, we're doing about 1% growth per year. The number of households with children went from 24% to 25%, but in the presentation from the school, we saw projections of a decline in enrollment coming forward, and I'm just, frankly trying to understand that maybe it has a little bit to do with what board chair Bennett had mentioned about um, people getting to that school age their kids are getting bigger they maybe are ready for a little bit bigger house and not having opportunities here but you know what else are those barriers what's driving sort of that you know if we see that the household growth is there the the number of children are there what else is driving the decline in the enrollment in the schools and uh, mr. mayor uh, board chair, uh, what you're seeing, yeah, I think that's part of it is right. You have that zero to four population, right? And then they're now baby number two is coming on and now they're thinking, oh, I need a bigger house and we didn't have quite that movement in the market in Bloomington. So they're looking elsewhere as the families expand. So there's partly that. And then I think uh, you brought up uh, that partly just other options. They're going to online, they're going to other communities, open enrollment, parochial schools, so that's that's part of it as well. Um, so I think those are the two factors where you're, I, we're seeing that population growth, but also who's moving into Bloomington as well, maybe we'll see with these apartment buildings. Is it two, fa two people or is it more of those families? And I think we've had such a boom in the last five years that it, it's just now starting to fill in. And yeah, I, I think as those families get to the school age, it'll be interesting to see if that changes at all. Board chair or planning commission member, Corman, we could, you, you wear many hats and you've got a front row seat on, on all of this information and the details for 
housing and, and enrollment and everything else. So thank you for your work on the Planning Commission and uh, the, the insight that you bring to a lot of the decisions that are made there. So thanks much. Something I should know, right? Yeah. For by now. <laughs> right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Palermo, I was just um, just uh, kind of following up a little bit on that uh, comment that um, Council Member Nelson had, and I was just thinking about um, the data that the city keeps. So, is the city or is the city keeping data, specific data? Because I know you have the general data, but is the city keeping data, or is the city able to keep data on uh, the specifics of? how many families or new families are we seeing that are moving into uh, those new projects that have been developed and uh, um, also um, the number of people within a family. Because one of the concerns that I have had for a while also is as we continue to develop, um, do we have enough space for bigger families? And you just mentioned that, the fact that you know, once the time comes and you have a new baby or your uh, kids are growing, then you need bigger spaces. So are we going to have that type of capacity with the current projects? So my question is more about the specifics of the family and the data that you can, um, that you can have and then later share with us. Yep. Uh, board Chair, Mr. Mayor, Council... <laughs> Board member Corman, <laughs> I almost said. Uh, so um, that is a good question. That is something we've talked about in the past. How do we get at that data? Um, when I this data just is, is census data, it lags a little bit behind, and it is a, a American Community Survey. So it's a survey. Um, so it, it, the accuracy can vary a little bit. Um, but there are other ways that we've talked about in the past. We just haven't had capacity to kind of go into it because when we have these affordable units, most of the time they're um, Section 8 or some other program that the city is kind of touching upon getting people into those units that we can potentially get at are those families moving into those affordable units. But that doesn't get at some of the market rate where it's a little bit harder to get at that data. Um, it, that's where the census data is maybe our, our best bet. Um, there's potential surveys or other information that we can potentially do it. But um, I think that it has been something that we've discussed, at least from our programmatic perspective, how many families. And because that also plays into us trying to get, with the affordable units, more larger units, three-bedroom, un three even four-bedroom units to accommodate larger families. Um, but we, we do look at other programs that uh, assist with first-time home buyers or other programs that we can see that we can potentially see what that family participation is. But unfortunately, given that whole city context, I think it's a little bit harder to get at accurate data outside the, the census, which does lag a little bit. All these titles. If <laughs> Board member starts. <laughs> Um, there's a slide and I, I can't find it in my packet so I can't tell it was about like where the percentage of growth was in, in, in the city had a bunch of colors that one so um, so this is interesting to me because when we look at if you were to overlay our schools onto that map we only have two elementary schools east of 35w and eight west of 35w so now I see when that huge growth in the south loop that makes me a little nervous I want Higher enrollment, don't get me wrong, but if it's all concentrated in one area, that could cause problems for our schools. So my question for um, you is, like, how far in advance, when, when these projects are going through that chart that you showed us, how far in advance does the school district get a heads up that there's going to be this facility that's going to have this many units, we expect this many families with children that may enroll in this school so that we can prepare um, our enrollment projections per site, not just overall? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Board Chair, um, I was told it's director. You're supposed to. Director. We're supposed to director. Starts. Director. <laughs> um, that is something that we have not done a good job about. Quite frankly, um, I know I've met with uh, your predecessor maybe once or twice talking about enrollment in some of these projects, um, but it's not something that we do on a regular basis. Which maybe is something that we we can 
look at doing in the future because you're right we do have this information on a pipeline and where we are expecting this growth and where that potentially could have impacts on enrollment so dr melby uh, thank you, Mayor. I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out because that's one of the reasons uh, I'm still pulling the new superintendent card out at this meeting, uh, just starting year two. But one of the reasons I was um, excited to have the opportunity to come back to Bloomington is this kind of discussion about you know where our interests intersect with the city and the school district and that we are one city and one school district. So folks have heard my story. I won't go too deep. But coming from Anoka Hennepin where you had 13 communities and two counties and trying to they're lucky in the sense that they have a bunch of cornfields that are still going to get plowed and have houses built on. So they're not worried about enrollment like we are in Bloomington. And they're not a built out, all built out communities like Bloomington tends to be. These are the great kind of conversations that hopefully we can have back and forth. I know hopefully we will have back and forth to help us with our planning and help you with your knowledge about um, the school age population in the city. So. I'm, ex I'm excited. I'm excited about these conversations and I'm glad we're having them, so thank you. Anything further? Thank you, Mr. Palermo. Thank you much. Item four on our agenda. Discussion on safe and innovative schools, the capital projects levy renewal. Mr. Kaufman, good evening, welcome. Good evening, Mayor Bussey, um, Chair Bennett, and our distinguished city council members and school board members and audiences uh, here in person and watching on TV. So let me share with you, we are going to take a few minutes, uh, colleagues John Weiser and Rod Zivkovich, Director of Technology and Director of Finance and Student Supports, um, Safe and Innovative Schools, our capital projects levy that's uh, on the ballot this fall, November 8th, and we handed gave you a handout uh, to decided to give you more information as well and follow along. So that's our purpose tonight, provide you an update on the 2022 Safe and Innovative Schools referendum, which is a request to renew the 2013 capital projects levy that was passed in 2013. That levy approval gave, uh, funded $6 million a year for about 10 years. It continues to fund um, and it expires in 2024. So we are going to the voters uh, a little bit early, um, but that's typical for Bloomington schools to ask voters before the expiration in the unlikely uh, event or the possibility that the, uh, the levy would not be renewed. Um, at least the first time we have an opportunity to go back to voters and make a better case for it, if you will. So it'll expire in 2024, and um, so we're asking voters to support uh, a straight renewal uh, for the safe and innovative schools referendum. Should the levy uh, pass, um, it would fund about $9.8 million a year, and our finance uh, guy here is going to tell us why that has increased and what that would look like moving forward. And it would be renewed for an additional 10 years, so uh, 2025 uh, through 2034. So let me share with you um, what we are at, what the ask will include. So for many of you that were around back in 2013 and 14, we were pretty robust in improving our school safety with significant uh, physical changes. We front end loaded, if you will, a, a large portion, a majority of the funds towards school safety, those significant physical structure changes of our schools, uh, and then augmented it with a video surveillance system, uh, access management system, uh, to a radio system uh, that we just brought online just uh, pre-pandemic and actually uh, just before the pandemic and we wrapped up uh, training with the last of our schools a couple weeks ago. The new ask really would be a visitor management system. So this is in addition to what we, what we call single point of entry. So we limit access to schools to one point of entry and you can't get beyond um, uh, the office, if you will, uh, without uh, being verified uh, that you have business to do in the school. A visitor management system is really an online uh, ability to do that so our staff does not have to do it each time, particularly in elementary schools where we have parents coming in, parent volunteers or other volunteers would just simply sign in a kiosk and it's verified that you have a reason to be there. Um, it would be used on, in all of our schools and the Educational Services Center, again, it's an authenticated uh, authentication system for visitors to our 
school system, to our schools and buildings um, to be there. Security upgrades, as you, uh, over 10 years, uh, um, nearly 10 years, uh, a lot of uh, first generation pieces uh, as with respect to school safety has improved. And so this would continue to fund those upgrades over time. Also maintenance and replacement and expansion of that access management system, alarm, video, and radio and communication systems. There is a continued need to add more security cameras um, uh, to our facilities, externally and internally, and then other pieces that really um, we don't share real publicly because of the integrity of the safety and security of our schools, what those specific pieces are. You would also go towards training, uh, threat and risk assessment. You're gonna hear tonight from uh, Jennifer McIntyre, Executive Director of Student Services. Um, uh, the work that she and Assistant Superintendent Dr. Mitchler uh, and others have uh, been working on the risk and threat assessment process. And now we need to uh, uh, really move that into our schools um, to identify those risks that not only of students that um, may be intending to harm themselves or others, which is really the extreme, but really more importantly, what risk behaviors they um, are encountering and how do we manage those and identify those. Licensing renewal costs and then any new initiatives based on best practices. That's the ask on the safety and security side. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Weiser to give you the insights on the technology. Hello, welcome again. Um, <clears throat> This is a variation on our uh, school board vision statement. Uh, we, our intent to, in educating students is to prepare them for a world that we, we can't anticipate fully. And so we plan for uh, the kind of skills that prepare students to encounter whatever new situations they develop. Often that, in, that comes with technology, preparing for skills that come with technology. So how do we do that? We have, Three main, three big categories of investment. So this referendum is an investment in our schools. It's an investment in our kids. And uh, the three big areas that we talk about are foundations, anytime, anywhere, learning, and opportunities. Foundations entails all of those uh, structural changes that we've done over the last nine years of the referendum. We moved our, our district to be a one-to-one -one district where every student has uh, enhanced access to uh, a piece of equipment, carrying a Chromebook every day. At younger grades, it's tablets. We took on the challenge of uh, Wi-Fi, uh, the Wi-Fi barrier, which is once you leave our schools, how many of our families struggle to continue to stay online? Those, those two topics pre-pandemic were, we were kind of leading uh, school districts in kind of um, embracing those, um, those issues because our community invested in us. It prepared us as well as any district could be prepared for COVID. And so I'm really proud of that work in the way it prepared us. Building that foundation is part of this renewal, keeping that foundation strong. And then building on top of that foundation is categories two and three. Anytime, anywhere learning is about expanding where learning takes place for students. So it's that in guaranteeing that internet access, but it's also help, helping our schools look differently. If you walk into one of our schools these days, if you haven't done so recently, I would encourage you to do so. You'll find flexible learning spaces that, uh, that encourage students to think creatively, move and, move and learn in different ways. Some of that investment comes through this process. Uh, we've, uh, we've adopted learning platforms, Seesaw and Canvas, which allow uh, uh, families and teachers to communicate even when we're not in the school day. As we look at the use of those platforms, we see that some of the most productive time for students ha tends to be uh, later at night. So I don't want to get in the way. I, I never want our staff to get in the way of learning. And so when we, where we can encourage learning, we can. We do. Uh, opportunities is another thing, is another area we build on that foundation. So one of those areas is computer science. Uh, um, I belong to an organization called MinTech here in Minnesota. It's an organization of uh, technical leaders across the state, um, including Best Buy on our border, some, uh, some tech uh, businesses that, who, who headquarter in Bloomington. There's a, there's a need in Minnesota to grow more computer scientists. Uh, we, we tend to have to import computer scientists into the state to meet the need of business. And so we are one of those leaders who are uh, trying to grow that program starting in K-12. And so I'm very proud of that work. Growing computer science means access to robots, 
programming, logical thinking, again, skills that transfer, no matter what world our students graduate into, skills that transfer into, into that kind of success. Okay. So we have two campaigns underway. First one is the informational campaign, which is legally all the school district uh, personnel are allowed to do. And the information campaign is really uh, at the school level. We found after 2013, which was a uh, far closer vote than the operational levy in 2017, that parents really connect with schools. Uh, surprise, surprise, right? And so uh, we know our greatest supporters are parents, and uh, so the information campaign is really driven by our schools. Each school has a team of parents, staff, and at the high school students that are um, charged with getting information, sharing information, along with that is to register parents that are not registered uh, voters. We have taken the voter records from the uh, Secretary of State, and we can identify who's not registered. That's all public data, by the way. Um, no, nothing nefarious about getting that information. Um, and really encourage parents to vote. We work with League of Women Voters and others to do registration drives. Um, and then there's an advocacy group, and that is the Yes for BPS Community Committee, com uh, currently being led by Paige Roman and Curtis Griesel. They are two. Curtis uh, and his wife uh, had three uh, former students go through our uh, schools uh, graduated from Kennedy uh, over the last couple years and Paige and his partner have two children in our school district um, middle school and an elementary student they lead a community committee of uh, retired uh, district staff members uh, some parents involved and certainly district uh, leadership in some of those areas and it's a small but very very active group to advocate for getting people to go and vote. Um, that's the key, most important part of it, and vote yes. School-based information campaigns, one of the most important things that when we looked at that data from the Secretary of State's office is that we only have about 40, uh, just over 52% of our parents are registered. This is a drop, um, as we would expect, that the population changes in Bloomington. Um, uh, we've typically been clo closer to 60% in past referendums and even higher than that when our population was much higher. But what this shows us is a lot of room for uh, growth in terms of registering parents uh, to vote. And so we can identify current and former parents uh, that are not registered and, and encourage them to register to vote. And again, with the help of the League of Women Voters. And I talked about that. That's what that committee looks like. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Zivkovich to talk about the finance part of this. Thank you. Um, Overall, like uh, Rick mentioned earlier about uh, the explanation of we started out with a $6 million uh, levy and now we're up to 9.8. If you remember uh, back in the uh, 2013, some of the TIF of the Mall of America was not off the, the roll. So since we have um, one of our only levies that has a percentage of our tax capacity, um, any change in tax capacity adjusts this amount. It's it's the same no matter what the dollar amount. It just stays at that well. That's the main reason for the increase of, of that going from a $6 million to a, a $9.8 million number. Um, and as we mentioned with that is on a uh, medium-sized home, um, yes, it would go up over time if the value of the home went up, but that rate is still the same uh, throughout the time period. So um, that's why we're, we've, we've stated many times that this is not a tax impact and only of value homes. We noticed the first year that we passed this referendum, it wasn't $6 million that we got. It was under $6 million because the values of the homes went down uh, for that period of time. So it is a fluctuation uh, within that number. Um, so we're, what we're asking for is a $9.8 million uh, for security and technology. Uh, one of the things that uh, we want to make very clear is uh, these dollars have helped us both in our operating technology area and our security area that if um, after the 23-24 school year, if we don't get this renewed, um, there will be some impacts to the general fund to be able to um, fund the basics that we need for technology and security. Um, this has helped out the general fund for us not to have to make as many uh, significant reductions over the years. Okay. 
And lastly, um, you all know the dates. Uh, last Friday was the first date, early voting. November 8th, 8th is the election date and uh, canvassing period uh, November. So we'll close and then take questions. A really key point to this is that this is a renewal of an expiring capital projects levy. It's simply a reinvestment in the dollars that we're receiving um, for safety and security and technology, specifically directed at those two uh, primary pieces. Um, as the emergency management director and community relations director, uh, I've been working in emergency management schools for more than 30 years, and I can tell you that there's no final step to, uh, to school safety. There is no one product, no service, no individual that can stop someone that wants to put, uh, bring harm upon themselves or others. What we can do, though, is to focus on those best practices through threat and risk assessment and those other physical structures that create barriers for persons that wish to do harm to others. What that means is it requires an ongoing commitment, an ongoing commitment to an unwavering focus on supporting these types of things. What is interesting, a couple weeks ago, uh, CBS News came to us and wanted to do a story about school safety because the New York brass told them um, that Bloomington schools in Bloomington, Minnesota seemed to be uh, one of those districts that had a lot going on in terms of school safety. Um, we were very proud of that, but what we were able to do is to show a lot of the things that we have in place. They're not state secrets anymore, but the reality is um, uh, that the fact is that the commitment of our community to support the 2013 uh, levy allowed us to do these things to put us at a point where other districts haven't even uh, begun to put in even things like access management um, or uh, you know trying to play catch up. I can uh, I can't can't count on uh, all my hands and toes how many calls we get um, after these kinds of stories um, asking what what do we do and what can they do. Um, so this is a reinvestment in school safety. It's a reinvestment in the security updates um, and best practices, and it's a reinvestment in next, te next technologies for learning to allow for growth of any time and anywhere solutions, all those pieces that John Weiser has brought to the district and his uh, incredible team. And before I close, I can't uh, 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 end this without acknowledging the incredible collaboration with Bloomington Public Health, Dr. Kelly, uh, through COVID, and a lot of the safety things that we talk about and uh, uh, Chief Hodges and his team and his predecessors. Um, we have had an incredible working relationship uh, in the 15 years I've been with uh, Bloomington Schools and the sharing of information and the collaboration is what we know helps to keep our kids safe. It's not just the school district, it's all of our partners. So with that, we'll be happy to um, take any questions you might have. Thank you, gentlemen. Questions, comments? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. It's my first time doing this. It's very exciting. Uh, I guess maybe for a lot of us, considering we haven't done it in so long. Uh, but um, uh, I, I have a question for you about um, if, a, if an average person is interested in knowing what the impact of the um, levy from the last 10 years has been on um, achievement, especially in technology, uh, achievements or anything like that. What's the where's the best resource for us to understand that? Um, because uh, you know, I'm I, these are all great, and and yet you know, as somebody who doesn't have kids in the school district, I don't have access daily to see the outcomes of those things. And so, you know, are we doing better on certain test scores, or are we? I'm making it up, right? Are we? Uh, I'm, certainly, you can say we haven't had an incident and that's awesome right and and i get that part but on the technology side can you point us to some places where we could look at achievements yeah we, thank you for the question yeah. uh we try not to draw a, a direct line from by a computer equals this uh improvement on test scores uh, we view technology as tools in the hands of educators the most impactful way to move uh assessment scores is through uh, instructors who are highly trained, who are well equipped, and who have the, you know, the tools and equipment and facilities to do their job well. And so, in that regard, um, you know, we have a, an annual an annual report we put out from our research evaluation and assessment department that talks about the achievement uh, in our district. I try again not to draw a line between technology equals, um, you know. Uh, responsibility for an improvement or responsibility for a drop in that achievement. Um, what we're doing is we're setting up the environment, the foundation, and the opportunities for kids and for their teachers to to thrive. So that's it. Yeah. 
Thank you. Just a quick follow up. To me, there's two there's two pieces of that. Then there's one is the we need to give these students the tools that they need to stay current with learning platforms, skills, things of that nature. And then there's the other piece of that, which you kind of met, alluded to, which was preparing students for the jobs that 10 years from now they will likely take on. Um, do we have any data about the latter? Like, are we doing a good job of preparing our students to go get those kinds of jobs? Like 10 years ago, did we anticipate effectively and now they're doing that those jobs? Do we have anything like that? Thank you. So I, I would like to invite, you know, my colleague, Dr. Julio uh, Cesar, up here in the data system, which tracks where our students go once they leave Bloomington Public Schools. Where do they land in the uh, job market? Where do they end up in college? Uh, or if they don't go to college, what kind of earning potential do they have? Uh, some of those um, outcomes, and I'm parroting uh, Julio here, are that uh, we prepare students pretty well and aligning those uh, advanced uh, outcomes in terms of monetary outcomes, better lifestyles and so on, map, mapping that back to our programs, back to our, uh, the education we provide uh, is an important part of that system. Dr. Melby? I'll jump into the answer and, and uh, John gave, gave a great answer. I've, I've heard earlier in the meeting that, that folks are maybe looking forward to having more of these joint meetings, and I, I know that uh, preliminary conversations with the city manager and mayor and myself and uh, Chair Bennett are around that exact topic because we do have interesting and robust and probably better than any other school district data on those uh, outcomes for students after they leave Bloomington Public Schools and, and what programs they were in and, and kind of where they are three, four, five, I don't know, Julio, how many years down the road. So I would say that would be something to potentially look forward to in the future. I was going to say, it sounds like we've got an agenda item for our next meeting. So, <laughs> so. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Just a, a quick one. And to be frank, doing what I do for my day job, I feel like I should know this for sure. But I just want to confirm, in order to renew the, the levy, it has to pass with just a, a, a bare majority of votes on the question, correct? 50% plus one of yes votes on that question. So someone who doesn't vote on the question at all, that doesn't count as a no vote, correct? Right. That's what I assumed. I just, like I said, just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Councilmember Loman. You know, Mayor, just a comment. I just, um, I, I just want to just say thank you, you know, around innovation and around security. You know, with, with the environment that we live in, in today, uh, just that we're being proactive about this. I just want to say thank you. That's all. Thanks. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a quick question. I know the the technology is to enable learning, not specifically to um, teach any particular thing, but there is some conversation about exploring computer science. Can this technology part of it be used to explore other areas? Um, one of the other areas that we've talked about are the trades and utilizing people that want to go with that type of path. Um, computer science is a fantastic path. We, we obviously have demand there. Uh, we need uh, nurses. Uh, you know, we need, we need a lot of different industry sectors within this. And is there a way to leverage this technology for all of those things, including computer science, and these other opportunities for our students? Yeah, that's, that's a terrific question. When I say computer science, I'm talking about the broad spectrum of computer science that includes everything from uh, a tech help desk, which we would consider part of the trades. We have a program through our Bloomington Career and College Academy that helps students focus in, in that area, which um, where um, in my generation might have been uh, more likely to go to like a shop class. So that is a pathway that we've developed over time. It includes um, some of the artistic professions when you think about design around web design and computer design. So it includes that broad spectrum of arts uh, education as well as the deeply technical work of computer security, uh, chip design and so on. So we're covering that broad spectrum. These, reef, these resources have to tie back to something with a uh, technology focus and so that that umbrella of computer science uh, helps us hit on many of those areas. Thank you, Council Member, and I like that answer. That's exactly where it should be. <laughs> Anything else? Director Corman. Um, thank you, Mayor. I just can't stop thinking about um, 
Council Member D'Alessandro's question. <laughs> and um, also, you know, the educator comes up in here as well. And I think this is important for our audience, even though we're getting more information in the future. I think people really want to know, so what is the benefit right now? Where do we track that success, right? And it's something, I would say, something that we see it every day in the classroom because the students are able to have easy access to information, immediate access to it, and um, they're able to gather more information and therefore they're able to have uh, those critical thinking skills developed while they're studying every day. Um, so that's one thing. And I think uh, we all know someone who is, I don't know, an elementary school kid, a uh, middle schooler, a high schooler, we know someone young who is able to do things better than we do when it comes to technology. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> just that kind of experience, the expertise that they have at an earlier age, things that we did not know, that we were not able to do, that now they're able to do because they have something in their hands and they have a way to use it. And not only that, our teachers are trained on how to use all those different um, those different, what are they called, uh, platforms, technology platforms, and then they teach them in the classroom as well. And so then you find students who are uh, making videos, for example. They know how to do an interview. You know, the kind of things that you probably also would need uh, for when you have a job, you know. There's a lot of things you can do in the marketing area that now they know how to do, and they're not even, they haven't even graduated yet. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to touch a little bit on that. You know, where do we see the success? We see it every single day in many very different aspects. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so first, I just want to thank each of you. So I have um, two kids in the Bloomington School District, uh, one in elementary and one now in middle school. Uh, he is very happy about that. Uh, he said he was afraid, he was ready to be away from the little kids. And I was like, all right. I was like, just wait until you see what's going to happen at the education. Like, well, anyway. Um, so uh, I just, again, I want to thank you. Of course, I want to echo thanks around safety and security, um, especially during uh, the, the day and age we're in right now. But I also wanted to thank you on the technology piece. So my daughter was in kindergarten when the pandemic hit. Um, and so really got the experience of using the platforms and all of the technology. Uh, so from kindergarten now through middle school, we've had that experience and it's been great, honestly. And then um, in addition to the students learning a lot, I just have to say, I don't know how my parents knew what I was doing in school when I was in elementary school and middle school, because I have such good insight. I can go on the, pla the web platform. I can see what Dylan's assignments were for the day. I know what grades he got. Like I just I have so much information at the tip of my fingers, and so if he doesn't turn in an assignment, he doesn't do well on a test, I see it right away, and so I just think that much to his dismay, um, and so I guess I just want to say that it empowers students in real time, but I think it also empowers families and parents and caregivers who can in real time really keep up with what their kids are doing in schools, and 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 I also want to say I really am looking forward to the conversation around that longitudinal data. I personally am like, cannot stand the, the standardized tests. No offense to anybody. Um, I have a kid and I have a kid who does not do well on them. And so um, it's not good for anybody's confidence when he gets those scores back. But when we look at the longitudinal data and we see what kids coming out of our schools are doing in the long run, that's going to be really helpful. And that's the most meaningful to me. So thank you again. Thank you, council member. If there's nothing else, I'd like to get, keep moving on on our agenda. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Up next is a discussion on Expo 2027. You may have heard a few things about Expo 2027. We've been, uh, as a city, uh, exploring the possibility of hosting an expo on behalf of the United States uh, for almost a decade now. Those discussions have been going on, and we are well involved in the process right now and have some exciting things to talk about. So Mr. Verbrugge is going to give us the... Presentation, Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, Mr. Chair, directors and council members. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go backwards for just 30 seconds and echo Council Member Carter's comments. I'm a first-time parent this year in the Bloomington Public Schools. As Dr. Melby knows, I'm hosting an exchange student, and uh, I have been thoroughly uh, impressed and grateful with the amount of communication from the school district and the access to um, 
learning and achievement uh, uh, almost in real time. And frankly, for a new student into the district who is not an English uh, first speaker, um, that integration has gone incredibly well. And that's, that's just because of the systems that you have in place. So I just wanted to make sure that credit is given to the school district for doing well there. All right, let's talk about Expo 2027. You've heard about this, as the mayor said. Uh, what we have discovered is that even though we have put out a fair amount of information about Expo and uh, why the city of Bloomington and the state of Minnesota and the United States are seeking this, there isn't a real good understanding of what Expo 2027 is. So we thought this would be a perfect venue uh, to try and share more information. So let's start with just what the heck is Expo, right? Um, Expos come... Uh, primarily in two different variants. On the left side of the screen, you see a specialized expo, like the one that was uh, held in Kazakhstan in 2017. And then there's an international expo, uh, like the one that was held in Dubai earlier this year. Specialized expos, excuse me, I'm going to start on international expos. International expos are what we um, sometimes refer to as world fairs. They are six months long. And the host country uh, can decide how large uh, of, a, of a footprint uh, it, it is on their own. So, uh, for example, in Dubai, their site was 1,100 acres, you know, uh, the equivalent of 600 football fields, to give you an idea of uh, how much space that was. Um, specialized expos, oh, by the way, and the international expos are held in the years ending in zeros and fives. Uh, so why did Dubai just wrap up in 2022? It was delayed for a year because of COVID, uh, also because Dubai is in a very warm part of the world. Um, they had scheduled it to start late in 2020, wrapping up in 2021. So that's why it carried forward from 21 to 22. Uh, specialized expos uh, uh, are held in between the international expos. So they're held uh, usually in the twos and threes or the seven and eights. Uh, and they can be no larger than 62 acres, uh, and they're only three months long. So it's half the duration and a much smaller uh, footprint. And the specialized expo is the type of expo that the state of Minnesota and the United States are seeking currently. So I mentioned World's Fairs, and people say, oh, they still do those? Yes, they still do those. They do those all around the world. They just don't do them in the United States anymore. In fact, the last time we had a World Fair in the United States was 1984 in New Orleans. Um, so uh, you, you are seeing some of the iconic structures that are leave-behinds or legacies of World's Fairs. Uh, the Seattle Space Needle, the Ferris Wheel was unveiled at the Columbian Exposition in Chicago in the early 1890s. Uh, the Eiffel Tower is a, is a legacy of a World Fair in Paris. Um, now, interestingly, uh, the international community prefers to call these expos. In America, we call them World's Fairs. Uh, either way, they're uh, tremendous events that are focused on uh, international learning, innovation, showcasing um, ideas for the future. So what happens uh, at an expo? So it's a little bit like a TED Talk combined with Davos, uh, combined with a trade show, combined with uh, Disney World. Um, depending on you know how big it is and, and how uh, complex it is. Um, but the, the fact is that there is constant learning that goes on. That's sort of the TED Talk thing. There are, there are featured presentations every day. Um, you have over 100 countries that are participating. In the international expos, it's usually close to 200 countries. Uh, and it's like a giant trade show because there's a lot of business-to-business -business activity that goes on uh, behind the scenes, especially based on the theme of whatever each of the expos are. And then just sort of the glitz and showmanship of, a, of a, an expo kind of lends it that Disney World feel. Uh, and the Davos aspect is because it is a huge international diplomatic um, engagement for that period of time. So the, the group that is behind the Minnesota effort has chosen the theme of healthy people, healthy planet, wellness and well-being for all. This theme is based on the fact that Minnesota has, um, frankly, one of the world's leading concentration of uh, health, medical, and um, wellness uh, uh, ecosystems in the whole world. So our uh, education, our research, our manufacturing, um, the, the technology development, all of that coming together, and then you have some world-leading applications in the Mayo Clinic, which is the top-rated hospital in the system in the world. Um, all of those create um, this fantastic um, 
uh, concentration, like I said, to have a really important conversation that has never been the theme of an expo before. Uh, if you look at the expo logo, the O is a um, variation, uh, it's iterative, of the United Nations uh, Sustainable Development Goals logo. Uh, the SDG number three is focused entirely on um, health and well-being for people. And so there is a very intentional effort uh, to connect the theme of the Minnesota USA Expo to the SDGs so that uh, participating countries and countries that will be considering whether they will support this uh, uh, proposal uh, can see a connection between issues that are important for them and issues that will be highlighted at the Expo 2027. So here's some of the impacts. Uh, it is, like I said, a three-month event, so it'll be 93 days. If, uh, if awarded to Minnesota, it would be May 15th through August 15th of 2027, uh, so as to wrap up in advance of the opening of the Minnesota State Fair because nobody wants to interrupt the Minnesota State Fair. Uh, like I said, 62 acres. Um, that 13 million visits is actually uh, in the in the um, application put forward uh, closer to 14 million. Uh, and I want to be clear, that's not unique visitors. That's the number of visits. The actual number of uh, unique visitors is probably more in line with about 7 million. Um, and that is based on a, a presumption that people who travel here uh, will probably go for more than one day, and people who live in the region are more, th more likely to go more than one day because there's different programming content throughout the whole three months. So ideally, people will go, they'll be interested, they'll see other things they want to go back. Uh, one billion global impressions, over $2 billion in economic impact. Uh, these are some of the recent World's Fairs. Uh, I mentioned on the zeros and the fives, so you see uh, Shanghai and Milan were uh, prior to Dubai. And then the specialized expos of Yosu, Korea, and Austin, Kazakhstan. Osaka, Japan is the next international expo in 2025. Interestingly enough, the sister city for Bloomington, Izumi City, is a suburb of Osaka. Uh, so... Uh, we had a delegation going to visit our sister city back in 2017, I believe, uh, or 2018, when on the, they were departing on the day that, the, um, that Osaka was awarded the International Expo for 2025. And so I, I quick called somebody who was part of that delegation, Councilmember Lohman, and I said, you need to know this before you land so that you can uh, celebrate with them what an important uh, and big deal this is. You'll also notice on this map, the left side of the map is pretty empty, right? Uh, going back to what we said before about there hasn't been a World Fair in uh, the United States in uh, almost 40 years, uh, there has not been one in Latin America. Uh, you might recall back in 2017, uh, Minnesota and the United States were competing uh, for 2023. That was awarded to Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, Argentina is not on the map because they folded their tent uh, due to the um, economic realities of COVID. They weren't able to go forward with their plans, so there won't be a specialized expo in the next couple of years. Uh, the purpose of this slide is just to uh, give you an impression of, uh, frankly, the level of uh, professionalism and gravitas behind this effort. Uh, Expo 2027, the Minnesota USA Expo Committee is its own independent nonprofit organization. Uh, Mayor Bussey and I are uh, members of the board, uh, but they have their own legal structure. The president and CEO is John Stanick. Uh, he may be a familiar name to you. He's a former CEO of uh, Quest in Minnesota, uh, former deputy attorney general and uh, Hennepin County District Court Judge. Uh, and you see some of the advisors who are listed there, including the former uh, campaign manager for Senator Klobuchar's presidential campaign. Uh, as you move down the list, the co-chairs of the effort, Mark Laurie, who is uh, the new um, uh, uh, partner owner of the Timberwolves and Lynx, and um, Bob Clark. Bob Clark was the commissioner general of the USA Pavilion at the Dubai Expo. Uh, made a tremendous impression with delegates from around the world, uh, went and visited every other pavilion uh, at Expo um, 2020, and uh, like I said, built a lot of goodwill. So having him as the co-chair of this effort uh, is uh, um, hopefully going to be very well received by the rest of the international community. 
So who's in charge of these things? Well, it's this group. It's the Bureau of International Expositions. The BIE is uh, an international partnership organization. It's based in Paris, France. Uh, There are over 160 uh, member nations. Uh, They each have uh, delegates, and there is one voting delegate per country when it comes to making the decisions. So the BIE uh, organizes the process for uh, the application and then the decision and then the governance uh, once awarded for the international expos, the specialized expos, and two other events, horticultural expos and the Triano uh, de Milano. Um, Horticultural expos are focused on, as you might uh, suspect, um, plants and agronomy and landscape architecture, natural environments. Uh, And the Triano de Milano is more of a a food and business um, organized expo. So here's a little bit of a timeline, and I want you to pay attention to the right side of this one. Um, Going back to 2016, the Minnesota effort, uh, when when, uh, the application was first put forward to the federal government, there's actually a process in federal law to determine how a decision is made for which um, state or city in the United States will be chosen as the USA candidate. Um, It has to go through a Commerce Department review. So back in 2016, uh, the Commerce Department and the Obama administration uh, vetted that application. There was a significant barrier, however, in that the United States was no longer a member of the BIE. Uh, We had withdrawn from uh, that organization and a number of other federal or international organizations back in the 1990s for um, various political reasons um, with Congress back then. So uh, there was a significant effort Uh, in Congress to get the United States to rejoin the BIE. Congressman Emmer uh, from Minnesota's 6th District and Senator Klobuchar led that efforts in the respective bodies. And uh, the vote was um, unanimous in the House, by the way. And uh, they had a big signing in the Rose Garden with President Trump. And um, the application went forward uh, in 2017. Um, So I think this may be one of the only... uh, initiatives or events or activities that um, Presidents Obama, Trump, and Biden all agree on. So uh, if you're wondering about whether there's bipartisan support for this, there always has been, and that bipartisan uh, support remains strong. So uh, again, the Commerce Department under President uh, uh, Biden uh, sanctioned the Minnesota application as the USA candidature, and a formal application was made in June of... uh, this year. Here's some of the impact numbers. Uh, like I said, um, that 13 million is actually closer to 14 million in the final uh, dossier that was put forward, the application for the number of visitors. Uh, 90% of those visitors are expected to come from beyond our region. Uh, the the um, vast majority of them will likely come from what we call the one-day travel shed. So think about how long it takes to drive to the Twin Cities from places like Winnipeg or St. Louis or Detroit. Um, that circle is where most of the visitorship will come from. But about 10% will come from uh, international travelers because, frankly, there is a group of people who are motivated to go visit these events every time that they're held. They like to travel around the world. These are um, big attractions. Uh, So there's a fair uh, number of international uh, visitors that will come. 33,000 jobs expected to be uh, created and over $100 per person of tax generation at the state, local, and federal level uh, for each visitor. This is the uh, site layout. Uh, hopefully this is familiar to you in our South Loop District. You can see the Mall of America. I think you all know where the Mall of America is. Does this pointer work? There, there it is. There's the Mall of America. So the core site is right here, just east of the Mall of America and what we call the adjacent lands. It's also been known as the Kelly Farm property historically. Uh, that has been sitting vacant as a parking lot for the last, I don't know, 35, uh, maybe 40 years, if not longer than that. Um, It's currently owned by Triple Five, the owners of Mall of America. The Bloomington Port Authority has a purchase agreement, so we have uh, site control on it. And then the site um, is connected by a, try to get my pointer working here, by a land bridge, or a a bridge, pedestrian connection here, that runs over 24th to this property 
uh, at, 40, uh, at 494 on American Boulevard, uh, which is previously the Ramada and before that the Thunderbird Hotel. Uh, and that is uh, city-owned uh, property already. The Bloomington Port Authority currently owns that property. In total, uh, that's about 58 acres. Uh, so it is within the 62-acre um, constraint of the Specialized Expo. This is uh, the, the architect's um, rendering of the possibility of what the host pavilion will look like. Uh, and as exciting and cool as this is, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to look like this. Um, <laughs> just because I would imagine that this uh, is, go if, if awarded, this design is going to go through numerous iterations, right? And so uh, I expect that we will see something that is equally stunning and exciting. Um, uh, this is looking from the southeast part of the property. Uh, so if you see uh, at the left side, there's a, a little conic-shaped thing that is bluish. Uh, that's this right here. Again, architect's rendering of what a water feature or uh, public art feature might look like, then looking from the northwest part of the property to the southeast. And then you can see the, um, the bridge and the pedestrian movement area uh, on the right side. Here's the competition. There are four other countries that are uh, currently pursuing Expo 2027 or 28. Uh, San Carlos de Bariloche in Argentina. It's actually uh, in the Patagonia region. Uh, Malaga, Spain, Belgrade, Serbia, and Phuket, Thailand. Uh, they all have different themes. Uh, Serbia has a theme around um, uh, sports for life. Phuket, Thailand is uh, organized around uh, medical tourism. Argentina is focused on... Uh, um, uh, technology and uh, the future and the environment especially. And then Malaga, Spain is, is uh, focused on uh, technology and the future cities. Uh, and then again, Bloomington has uh, a theme of healthy people, healthy planet. So some of the benefits for the world is it bring these countries together, especially in the final six to 12 months before Expo opens. Um, the delegates and the contingents from the uh, various countries are all working in close proximity together, and that includes countries that sometimes don't work together in close proximity or are not viewed as collaborators. So there's a fair amount of uh, international goodwill that is built up by their delegations here. Um, I don't know if any of you remember uh, the... Festival of Nations. Do they even still do the Festival of Nations, right? I remember when I was a kid going to that and what a cool event that was, having all these different countries exhibiting food and culture. And that's the experience that you get out of an international or a specialized expo. Uh, United States uh, gains a lot of benefit from international commerce. Uh, in fact, the United States Department of Commerce is uh, very interested in this because of how it promotes um, that international business um, uh, opportunity. For the uh, State Department, this is also a significant effort because of uh, how it allows the United States to exert soft influence and public diplomacy uh, and to make sure that uh, uh, messaging on uh, the importance of democracy is received through, throughout the world. In Minnesota, again, uh, recognizing that we have that concentration, that industry cluster around um, health and medicine, uh, and this is a tremendous opportunity to expand that. Uh, we have an organization here called Medical Alley, which uh, includes um, med tech uh, manufacturers. It is the largest, most successful organization of that business cluster in the world. Uh, and this is also important for Greater MSP, our regional economic development organization, and the Department of Employment and Economic Development uh, for growing Minnesota business. And here in Bloomington, uh, uh, we'll be very clear that there's going to be some financial windfall. Uh, as you know, we uh, maintain admissions tax of 3% on all entertainment venues. So every ticket that is sold for Expo, there will be a 3% um, tax that comes to the city's general fund. Uh, we also have lodging tax. Uh, so imagine uh, the Super Bowl, which had about a 10-day impact here, where our hotels were completely full. Um, this would be like having the Super Bowl for three months. Uh, where we would see occupancy in our hotels probably pushing 90-95% uh, for most of that three months. Typically our occupancy is in the range of 65-70%, um, to 70%. Uh, so it's a pretty significant uh, increase there. And then obviously um, as, as the construction is being done, there's revenue that comes in through the permitting and the construction, but also this legacy development, and this is really the primary interest for the city of Bloomington. Uh, South Loop um, 
I've heard it said by a number of people, uh, lacks a soul, right? And so creating a soul for South Loop, but also a signature legacy um, aspect that will be recognized around the world because communities that host expos um, are permanently recognized as World Fair cities, frankly. Right? So it builds a certain amount of prestige. But even beyond all of that, the importance for the city of Bloomington is having um, lasting economic development in the South Loop that is hopefully going to um, build on the theme and will create um, more jobs, uh, will create um, more um, business opportunity in that district, and it will uh, just uh, c cement the South Loop as a, as a live-work district. And then other business, other benefits for Bloomington, um, it brings people in here. Each of the countries have a day where they ex uh, they exhibit, uh, they they celebrate, they get a parade. Dignitaries come in, um, a lot of commerce and B two B activity that goes on. So a lot of use of meeting rooms and uh, you know think about the conference space and the meeting space and hotels that are near the site. All of those uh, folks will benefit as well. And here's the timeline. Uh, like I said, in June, the formal application was submitted. Um, the uh, BIE inquiry mission will visit in October. Uh, that is a, essentially an executive committee that goes to visit each of the candidate countries uh, to vet the applications, to view the sites, to, um, to assess the political and civic and community support for these types of events. Uh, for the U.S. visit, they will also spend time in Washington, D.C. Uh, I know they'll be visiting the White House and the State Department while they are there. And then uh, in June of next year, the BIE will vote to select one of those uh, five countries. And if we are selected, it will start about a 46-month sprint uh, to get to May of 2027 when a heck of a lot of work has to get done. So I'm going to stop, Mr. Mayor. That was a lot of ground that I covered and tried to do it in a short period of time. Thank you, Mr. Verbrugge. Questions, comments? Councilmember Lohman. Thank you. Uh, you've done a nice job of explaining what the benefits are to the city. Um, and I also like that you po pointed out um, that uh, it's a nonprofit organization that's leading this. What's the cost to the city and the taxpayers? Sure. Um, Thank you, Councilmember Lohman, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, and uh, Chair Bennett. So, um, Activity that is being funded by the city uh, right now is primarily uh, uh, travel associated with it. The, the mayor and I, several staff members, another council member, uh, have visited the uh, expo in Dubai. Um, we've gone to meetings in, in Paris because that's where the BIE and the delegates are located. Uh, most of that travel is being funded out of what we call the South Loop Development Fund. That Fund is um, the revenue comes from uh, hotel lodging tax uh, that is generated um, in the city of Bloomington. Uh, so it is not general property taxpayer dollars that are paying for that. Um, there are some charges that have been uh, to our general fund, so it's a very minimal amount. Um, back in 2017, we uh, put a lot more money into the effort. Um, because, frankly, it was uh, a um, less well-organized and structured effort back then. We needed uh, to put in a fair amount of money to build out the development pro forma. And I want to be real specific in saying that uh, if this goes forward, uh, the expo committee will be responsible for the costs of organizing and operating the expo event. It will not be a city-run event. Uh, and um, we, are, we will treat this as we treat any other development project in the city of Bloomington, um, where we will likely have a master developer of the expo site who we'll, we will work with as a development partner. Additional questions? Very good. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Verbrugge. Stay tuned on that one. More to come, I'm sure. <laughs> Item six on our agenda is uh, a discussion on the city and school district chemical health joint efforts. We have a trio joining us, Jennifer McIntyre, Anna Hatch, and Dr. Nick Kelly from the city of Bloomington. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Uh, 
Chair Bennett, Superintendent, members of the board and members of the City Council, I'm Hannah Hatch. I am the Director of Health Services for Bloomington Public Schools. And joining me tonight is Jennifer McIntyre, who's the Executive Director of Student Services and Health Services, and then Dr. Nick Kelly, who is the uh, Administrator of Public Health, Administrator of Public Health for Bloomington Public Health. So I will start us out tonight, and the purpose of our presentation today is to discuss with you a problem that we have identified this fall and really been working very hard on as a team, and that is uh, the identification of an increase in chemical use and toxicity that we are noticing throughout our middle schools and high schools in the district. Uh, we've been partnering with uh, Nick Kelly around this issue because as you'll find in our presentation, we're finding out this is a bigger issue than just within our school district. What we're seeing is, unfortunately, a large increase since we've come back from the pandemic. We know that drugs have been an issue or substance use has been an issue. However, we're seeing a marked increase in the use within our schools that has created some concern um, for us as a team. And what we've been seeing is an increase in uh, vape pens, in THC, in opioids, and in other substances throughout our district and community. The drugs we are seeing used today are a lot more potent than they've ever been before. So one of our concerns is that uh, the use that we're seeing today is very different than the use that we may have um, seen when we were kids or what you've heard about when you were younger. For an example, the THC that we are seeing used today is over nine times more potent than it was in 1990 and the use that was taking place then. So that's posing some extra concern for us um, as we navigate that. Another big concern is with the opioid epidemic. Um, a lot of the opioid use we're seeing is fentanyl, which is a much more potent drug than we previously had seen um, in that category. And so it's just creating some concerns and new challenges as we navigate this. Along with that, um, due to this use, we're seeing some increase in medical assessments in our district, um, 911 calls throughout the district and community, and an increased use in Narcan. About five years ago, we were approached by Bloomington Police Department around um, implementing Narcan within our school district. So we do currently stock Narcan in our district, and unfortunately, we have had to utilize it. Uh, with that being said, when we talk to Alina, EMT, and um, different services throughout our community, they have seen the same increase that we're seeing. Uh, recently, Alina EMTs uh, told us that they average about 12 calls a day uh, concerning drug issues. So the other thing we wanted to address today is that as we've dug into this issue and really uh, work to kind of see how we can find a solution about around this, what we noticed right away is that the chemical use that we are seeing both in our schools and in our community is actually a symptom of a lot bigger issue going on. And so we uh, have started to kind of scratch the surface of that, but you can think of it as the tip of an iceberg that we are seeing chemical use, but the use that we are seeing is a coping mechanism for a lot more going on underneath. And that is what we've been working to team with public health to kind of dig into um, in this work. With seeing chemical use as a symptom, some of the things we've seen along with that are increased disengagement from school and activities, uh, decreased family engagement and involvement in some of the students we have concerns about, and then increased risk factors for students that we've noticed have been reflected in our student surveys and data. So an example of that would be in some of our student surveys, we've seen students identify an increased um, feeling of loneliness, or we've seen them in indicate that maybe they don't have an adult that they trust that they can connect with. And those that's what we're referring to when we talk about increased risk factors um, reflected on some of our student surveys. So some of the risk factors that we've really identified and are kind of looking into are first trauma, so ACEs, which would be um, the childhood events that would take place. I think we've all heard of that. And with trauma specifically, that can 
as we're finding in research around trauma is really can be in the eye of the beholder. Um, and what I mean by that is two people can experience a very similar thing and one can walk away experiencing trauma from it. And so that's important as we look at that is, you know, it's really hard to tell someone you've experienced trauma and you haven't because it's really how someone has experienced that. But that is a huge risk factor when we look at the substance use we're seeing. Another one is use in home. So if their parents are using or using in front of them or they're witnessing that, that is a risk factor we noticed. Uh, increased access to substances. This is a really big one for us. If I'm sure you've all heard the um, legalization of edible THC created a lot more access um, to THC or edibles throughout Minnesota. And then in addition to that, as I mentioned, um, fentanyl, uh, being on the market now is an opioid that you really people can manufacture in their basement and so that creates a huge increase in access to some of these concerning substances that we're seeing another one would be untreated mental health issues um, as we all know we've seen an increase in some of this following the pandemic and so uh, when left untreated that definitely can be a risk factor and then lastly use among peer groups. So when our students are witnessing their peers using, they are much more likely to then also start using substances. Okay, our slides are a little mixed up too, so I apologize. Uh, lastly, the, what is the impact on our students that we're seeing? So one, the really obvious one that we immediately wanted to get a handle on and start addressing is it's a safety concern for our students. So anytime someone is actively using substances under the influence um, in school or out of school or experiencing withdrawal symptoms, that's an immediate safety issue, obviously, that we identify within our schools, within our health office, um, and our activities and events outside of school. It's a safety issue for that person that is using. Again, we're as I mentioned before, we've identified that this is a symptom of much deeper issues going on. And so that's something that's impacting our student. We need to uncover kind of what is going on underneath. Is it loneliness? Is it boredom? Is it um, a feeling of isolation and wanting to fit in? And so we are working to kind of identify what is that, what is impacting our students that's driving to this coping mechanism that we are seeing. And then lastly, uh, other, student, other students witnessing substances taking place around them um, tend to feel less safe in their environment. So if they have peers using around them at activities or at um, in school or at after school activities at a friend's, um, oftentimes they tend to feel less safe in that environment. So those are all impacts we've found um, and are aware of on our students. So I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Jennifer now to talk a little bit more about what we're doing um, as we've identified these things. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah, um, for going over the information. We have been meeting as a school district, and quite honestly, we've been meeting for the last couple of years specifically in this area. Um, we have had a team, a chem chemical health team, we like to often call it our chem health team, but a chemical health team that has come together and has been comprised of our health department, as you have um, met Hannah tonight, um, our student services department. We work closely with the assistant superintendent, uh, Dr. Mitchler. We work closely, closely with communications and safety. You met Rick Kaufman. Um, this evening, uh, we've come together as a team and we have our principals represented and other folks represented that come together to discuss this and look at the information. And Hannah and I also have the uh, unique opportunity and actually maybe we're very uh, fortunate in that we work closely with Nick Kelly um, and hand in hand in sharing information back and forth. We look at our Minnesota student survey um, data and information to have a better understanding of some of these underlying issues that Hannah has been referring to, as well as our chemical health use um, and uh, and uh, when we work with uh, Nick Kelly and our police department, what is the addiction rates? What is the over, um, overdose rate? What does that look like? So we factor all of those components into it. Um, age that we're seeing within Bloomington, um, what, what do we need to factor in our schools when we really consider educational components and then addressing this as a school district? As we have brought our chem health, um, chemical health uh, task force together within our school district, we have started to seek out, um, because coming back from uh, the implications educationally with COVID, what we have come back to is we have students that are uh, 
experiencing higher need or needs for us to wrap services around them in social, emotional, and uh, behavioral um, areas, mental health areas. And so we have been doing that by increased uh, social workers in our buildings, um, and we have been really looking at how do we provide additional services and training to our social workers, our school psychologists, our school counselors in the area of chemical health. Um, we're bringing in and looking at outside agencies who specialize in this area to work directly with our programs and with our, our folks in our building as well as doing some direct instruction with some of our students who are really needing the service. Um, we have identified in looking at um, the, the precursor symptoms that we, we have been looking at is the disengagement, um, students who are reporting not coming to school, what are the absent rates, where are our patterns and absences, what does that look like for specific students starting already in our older ages of uh, elementary, fourth and fifth grade. Through our middle schools, we are seeing an increase of use of vaping um, and and vaping of uh, THC is also something this year coming back that we're very, very heightened about in checking and watching into our high schools. Developmentally, we have different approaches at different levels because students are at different levels um, in, on that, um, on that uh, journey, I suppose, in a sense. Right now, we are working to obtain resources for our, families, uh, our students and our families in the community um, to continue to support them. And that has been some of the work we've been able to do with uh, Nick and his department to look at what do we have available within Bloomington, within our neighboring um, cities. Um, we've reached out to Richfield Public Schools and Edina Public Schools to really look at this as our neighborhoods cross um, over one another. Um, I can forward my slides. Oh, one more. Um, as we sat down and looked at the City of Bloomington strategic plan, um, and that was something we had an opportunity to discuss with Nick Kelly, what we found is that within the strategic plan, um, not only for Bloomington Public Schools, but then also for the City of Bloomington, that there are some very nice alignments as we start to do our work together. Um, knowing we're coming to a joint council tonight and really having both boards um, sitting to look at this work that we're, we're really forging forward on because we're seeing such an increased need right now, here are three areas within the strategic um, object objectives and Actually, in all three of the strategic objectives, we found there would be really good crossover between the work we're doing in our school district as well as the work we're doing here in the, the city of Bloomington. Um, really having that community and um, hearing about the Expo 2027 makes me think about he healthy people, healthy lives, healthy um, community. And it, it really forged knowing we were presenting on this tonight. That's our direction. That's what we want to go for all of our, all of our, our young people, all of our learners, but most certainly our community members for sure. Um, having that safety and security, the, the presentation we heard earlier today about what we're doing with our safe and secure schools and how we're looking at the information across our school district, but most importantly across our entire community to provide that. And then the opportunity to continue to align our work. Uh, we started some of that alignment already last Friday as we brought together many um, departments to look at our opioid, opioid um, over. Uh, oh, overdoses between the um, cross-city um, discussions. We were part of those conversations. And as a school district, we're actively involved, wanting to be at the table to have the conversation. We see it coming up in our schools, and we really want this to be um, a priority for us to look at as we move forward. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Nick Kelly to share the next part of our presentation. So as, <clears throat> as you've heard, there's, there's a lot of work that's happening between the school district and our city staff, not just in public health, but across the city, we're, we're, it's fun to be able to work across the teams and, and work to do things to impact our community. And trying to think about how to pivot a little bit of that thinking, um, reframing it to think about our community is really created and sustained by the people that live, work, and visit here. They're our foundation. For us to be in that enduring, remarkable community where people want to be, we have to work at cultivating that reality. That requires looking at those factors that impact the foundation of our community, such as the housing we talked about tonight, employment, education, transportation, access to parks, health and well-being of all individuals. One concerning trend we're, we're talking about is the increase in substance use, especially seeing that in our schools. <clears throat> As already been articulated, we're trying to dig into the why, not just the fact that it's happening. And so looking at those factors about increasing the risk of substance use in schools, as Hannah talked about the childhood trauma in our community, substance use in the homes, untreated mental health issues, and, and use among peers. We have an opportunity to address that crisis and invest in our foundation, our community. The solution 
really looks at having all of our vested partners coming to that table and working collaboratively towards that shared goal that I think the school board and the city council are both very clear about what they want to see in the community. We're here from the public health standpoint to help work with our partners to get to that opportunity. So when we think about that from a, a reality standpoint, this was a trend that's not new. Um, in 2018, our community health survey, we started to see some of these trends. 2019, when we were working and analyzing the student survey data in coordination with our district partners and, and talking with the counselors, we were seeing data points that gave us concern. That, okay, we're, we're nervous about this. The next data point we're gonna see is the, the student survey data that's coming out. Um, we'll get to work more of that towards the end of this year. Uh, but indications are it's that trend is actually being pronounced rather than just a single data point that was giving us concern. COVID made almost all those trends worse and it caused new challenges. Uh, we're continuing to see those challenges today and we're seeing those impacts right now in our schools. Bloomington's not unique. We're seeing this across the state, across the country, and across the world. This is not uh, a unique thing to Bloomington. The thing about Bloomington is we're uniquely equipped with our partners and our connections to address it. So a lot of what, what has been talked about is how to deal with some of the substance really gets into the acute reality. That's that 10% of that clinical care. When we think about those root causes, like how do we stop some of this from occurring? Um, I, I think sometimes I frustrate our district partners because they're like, there's this challenge now, we need to find a solution. And I'm trying to reframe it to be, okay, let's think about how we keep those fifth graders from becoming like the 11th graders that you're dealing with now. That's, that's a time frame that's challenging when you're in a crisis. But that's the way public health often approaches it of, okay, let's fix some of those foundational issues and appre uh, approach that problem. Most of this pie chart are things that are in your control. The social economic, the health behaviors, the things that our, our local governments excel at. That's where we have incredible opportunities to make transformative change in the community. So our, our initial response Partnering with the school district is really trying to connect, provide technical assistance and support, but really looking at those long-term, mid-term solutions. So as was mentioned, uh, the opioid settlement work, you know, we have 15 to 18 years of funding that's gonna allow some transformative work on opioids. It's only opioids. We look at our community health assessment, our community health improvement process that uh, the council may recall, we made some changes in how we do that uh, on our end so that we can do more of this work. We also have a whole lot of information from our community that is telling us what to do. So if you think about the feedback we've gotten from the community, uh, the youth town hall that happened in 2020, the racial equity planning that's been happening, there's recommendations in there. The BTT strategic planning, um, there's 80 pages of an appendix that has answers to four really important pertinent questions to this topic that the action teams worked on, but we can still look and pull more data out of. We have this Southgate Renter Health Collaborative the district and the city staff work on. We have an opportunity to revisit some of this data, revisit some of those recommendations with some of those community partners, and look at it in charge of this kind of new challenge we're seeing today and bring those recommendations back to you for, for how to move forward. Our, uh, our council may be very familiar with this graphic. It's something that the city looks at for how do we engage when we're working with our partners. And that was one of the things as we were preparing is, well, what, what are we bringing back to our, our partners? What would we bring back to the youth we're working in the community or some of the partners that did some of this work? Are we informing, consulting, collaborating? engaging, empowering, and trying to think about that frame for how we would go about doing this work, which kind of led us to a couple of questions for you. Um, do you want us to bring like a more formal connection between our city and school staff and engage with some of these partners in light of some of these challenges with the data we have to come back with some opportunities for, for next steps? 
Do you want us to map out that timeline process, potentially look at the, the implications from a budget standpoint? And then how do you want us to do that with those partners? And I think we've got agenda item number two for our next meeting. <laughs> 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 the, yeah, they are outstanding questions. And um, given where we are in the meeting right now, to, to start to dig into them, I don't think we could do them the justice they deserve. So, uh, I mean, I, I say it, it, make light of it, but I, I say it for in, in all honesty as well. I think this, this would be a conversation for the next time we get together uh, to really dig into this and to really have this conversation. Uh, whereas tonight we're mostly presentations and questions, another opportunity would be to actually sit as a group like this and have a conversation answering questions like that. So I appreciate you bringing those forward. Anyone with questions, comments? Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just briefly, kind of in the interim here, I'm getting back to, to the new kind of landscape for THC in particular, if, if I'm understanding it right, there's no... Uh, age for consumption of the product. I understand there's age for purchase of it. But as we look at something like our legislative priorities uh, that the city is putting forward, I mean, even before we put together a formalized program like this, potentially, um, I I'm imagining there is a lot of opportunity for collaboration with our state-level policymakers, because that's just a crazy situation, if you ask me. So uh, I especially in terms of collaborations with other levels of government and other organizations, it's already happening here. And I bet we could get rolling before this. So, thank you, Council Member. Uh, Director Corman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, until the next time that we meet, um, what would be the next steps between now and then? I just see it as something that is so urgent. Thank you, Director Corman. So you're right, we feel like it's very urgent as well. And as Nick kind of said, uh, Jennifer and I in the school, we are living the here and now and the crisis of it. And we, but then we're also recognizing, right, this is a bigger problem underneath. So what steps can we take? And so we actually uh, have been meeting very regularly as a chemical health team. And Jennifer mentioned we brought in some outside agencies of professionals to get some input on this and what we could implement for students. So where we're at right now is we're getting towards the end of that um, planning stage. Tomorrow we're bringing a proposal to principals. Next week we're bringing it to uh, Superintendent Melby and doing some work around Around, hey, here's some proposals we have to put in place. We've been looking at our um, policies and procedures throughout the district on this. And um, a big part of our proposal is doing a lot of training and equipping of our staff um, to better be fit to deal with these situations because we definitely agree with you that it's urgent and um, we're trying to move on it as quickly as possible. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members and directors. Uh, Dr. Melby and I haven't talked about when the next convening of a uh, concurrent meeting might be, but I think January is probably a safe bet because obviously we have holidays and such at the end of the year. Um, I might offer a suggestion that our staff work on maybe um, providing some information to the individuals with each body with some um, very focused questions and give you some time to think about them and provide written response back to our staff. And then maybe we can uh, start the conversation by bringing together some of the information, the feedback that you'll have an opportunity to think about over the next couple months. And that will maybe help shape the uh, next conversation so that it is constructive and, and we can move towards a decision making um, thought there. I would agree that January is probably the most logical time, but I would encourage it to be early in January, and we don't have to get too far after the new year to get get back after this and get back together once again. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so I guess I just want to be, I'm, I'm seeking some clarity. So what I'm hearing is that we do want to, con like we want to move these conversations forward. Just it's the kind of more of the specifics that we're wanting to make. And we can't make decisions on specifics. Like even the last question would be very hard to answer right now. But in general, we agree with um, what they're saying, that we need to be working together on this issue. So 
point of clarity there. And then also, I am curious with the opioid settlement work. I don't. I know that there was a settlement. I don't know much more information about that. And if Bloomington is receiving local resources to work on that as an issue, I mean, it seems like the decision has actually already been made, right? We are going to be doing that work, and it makes sense to partner with the school district and do that planning and assessment. So I guess I don't, I just don't know a ton about that though. And so maybe you could provide a little bit more information on what that, what those settlement resources are and when we anticipate getting them and what they're for. Mayor, uh, Chair Bennett, uh, council members and directors. We uh, are just starting that work in earnest. So uh, the cities of Bloomington, Erdine, and Richfield have, uh, we're planning to partner uh, and share those resources across the three cities. So it's, it's a little over $2 million between the three cities over uh, about 18 years. Um, so that, that turns out it's, it's a nice amount of money, but it's, it's a small amount of money per year. We had our first meeting uh, with representatives from all three cities and partners, school districts, providers, to try and map out what that looks like, recognizing that uh, if you think back to the transformative work that occurred with tobacco, uh, with the settlements that happened in the 90s, this is the opportunity of opioids to do that transformative, massive changes to the way uh, we think about those substances. And so that work has that charge of being innovative, broad, and uh, very collaborative, and really driven not by Nick and his team coming up with a great idea, but the community, the partners that we have at that table, driving those decisions uh, and, and bringing them back to, to council in all three cities. So it is just starting. Dr. Melby. Uh, I would just like to point out that this is another example of the opportunities that we have with one city, one, uh, having a public health department like this, the partnerships with our neighboring communities. Uh, as Dr. Kelly pointed out, this isn't a Bloomington thing. This is a Minnesota and a national thing. And, and uh, I think we're well positioned to come back in January with uh, more in-depth conversation and some, some more information about how as a district we're addressing things as well as how we're partnering with the city and public health to address things. So I, I, would, I would just point out that um, we're acknowledging an issue that needs to be dealt with, but we're in good position to deal with it. Absolutely, absolutely. Nothing further? Thank you all very much. Interesting, interesting topic, interesting information. We're to our uh, adjournment and closing remarks. I'm going to turn to uh, Chair Bennett. Let him go first. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to thank um, all the engagement tonight from our board members and our council members, superintendent, manager, and mayor, and all of our wonderful presenters. Um, this is, a, I'm hoping, to be the first of many meetings that we do joint together. And again, I want to thank you guys all for um, inviting us into your, to your home, into the city council <laughs> chambers. And I look forward to being able to reciprocate when we host the next one and hopefully in January and it should be a good time. So I have, without any other business on the agenda, the, I can go ahead and adjourn the school board portion of this meeting and turn it back over to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And uh, I would echo the thanks to everyone uh, on both the board and on the council for being here this evening and for having this conversation. Uh, it, it has It is long overdue and I'm glad we finally did it and I'm glad we I uh, have everybody nodding in agreement that it's something we need to continue to do. Uh, Dr. Melby kind of stole part of my, my thoughts here um, with this notion of the, the city and the school district having the, the, the same boundaries. I mean, there are so many areas that don't have that benefit, and I do believe it is a benefit. And I think it's an untapped resource for, for this community, and we need to find ways to, to tap that resource and to use it. Uh, I was surprised we got to the last, it was the last presentation before anybody used the word alignment. And if, if, you've, <laughs> if you've heard me talking, I'm, I'm a big fan of alignment, not only between these two bodies and the, the schools, the, the city, but our business community, our friends at Normandale, uh, so many different resident organizations and groups. We have a, a, a great community here and a great opportunity to bring this all together. I am so encouraged by the work that uh, we was put forward with the Bloomington Tomorrow Together 
the strategic planning process that a number of you were uh, a part of. I, I think it sets a great framework for us to move forward and to start all of this and, and to move forward in alignment, whether it is on uh, public health, uh, the, the opioid epidemic, the fact that we might host a world expo, uh, all those different pieces that we talked about tonight. It's, we've got some exciting things moving forward here in the city, and I'm excited to continue the conversation uh, among us and uh, continue moving forward with it. And I do want to say, uh, the final thing that I want to say, uh, so it has been a while since we've been together, and um, I have said out loud, and I will say again, over the past three years, I would not have taken a school board job for all the money that is available. You folks took on a, a beast of a challenge over the last two and a half years, and I just wanted to say thank you for the work that you did, and thank you, and I, and I want to tell you how much the community appreciates the work that you did, because it was not easy. It was an enormous challenge, and you did it with, uh, with, with heart, and you did it with logic, and you did it with the the best interest of this entire community at the forefront. And I appreciate that. And thank you so very much for the work that you did. I don't think it gets said often enough. So yes, thank you, Duane. I think a round of applause. So well done. Thank you so very much. I'm, I'm proud to serve with you. So thanks much. With that, I will adjourn the city council portion of this meeting. And I will say thank you to everyone who's tuned in and watched this evening. And thank you to everybody who uh, is here. And thanks to the staff members who have presented tonight so wonderfully. Thanks much. Good evening, all.